this has been a much requested video over the years and it is high time we addressed it. For those of you that don't know, Michael- High time. High time. Okay, cool. Yes. Michael started his professional career as an attorney in the Air Force. He was active duty. Career option B after baseball didn't pan out. Right. Law school ensued. And then, okay. Okay, yes. Yeah. So the first real paying full-time professional job was as an attorney right. in the Air Force. And many of you don't know that, or those of you that already do have asked about the whole thing, what it was like. Mm -hmm. And I just want to bring up that we are in no way <coughs> diminishing um, life in the military. Michael was only active duty for four years. Yep. That's right. It was a career. We didn't have a, not a totally career in the typical experience, and we are in much awe and respect of those yeah. that have given their entire, entire careers, or their careers lives and, and their families, yeah. lives. Unfortunately, many yeah. times that's a whole different ball mm -hmm. of wax. But this is our experience. Absolutely, and it's an, it was an important experience. I mean, wouldn't you agree that the things that we experienced in the military, values, um, just whole disposition, outlook on life, was influenced in the way that we're oh, totally uh, living as a family today even it completely influenced yeah. our lives so we're going to start Absolutely. from the beginning okay why don't you explain how we uh, kind of got involved in the military Ooh. and how things kind of panned out i we're, married into it so you start with how it got into how well, you it was did a joint it. effort we were in st louis uh, engaged i was in law school and um, looking for career opportunities and had i guess a few private sector opportunities mm -hmm. to join a uh, law firm had an in-house opportunity for a very large corporate entity um, that we were kind of happen. mulling over. But at the same time, I was doing an internship with a federal judge in mm -hmm. St. Louis, Missouri, who himself had served in the military, worked as a prosecutor in the JAG Corps. And, um, you know, That's he, what they call the, the, right, the lawyers. Judge Advocate General Department or Judge Advocate General Just like the Corps. TV show. Um, right. Just like a few good men. <laughs> um, not at all. But... Um, for me professionally, um, the opportunity to get in the courtroom to try lawsuits, is, it's very difficult to do in the private sector, in a law firm, or in a private company. Uh, the government in America, the government service as an attorney really provides you the best opportunity, especially as a young, young lawyer out of school, to get real world, you know, courtroom experience, be a trial advocate, be in front of juries, you know, cross-examining witnesses, putting on evidence. And, uh, you know, having worked for this judge who I was very fond of and kind of influenced me professionally, um, you know, he had connections and was able to, you know, get me recommended and, and get me into the JAG program with the Air Force. You got yourself. I got myself in, but he kind of was a segue towards getting yeah. in, I would say. And so I ended up... And where did you interview? Uh, I interviewed for the JAG position specifically at Scott Air Force Base mm -hmm. outside of St. Louis and on the Illinois side. Yep. In Belleville, Illinois, O'Fallon, Illinois, I guess is that where it was. I don't yeah, I think it's Belleville, Illinois. Mm -hmm. So when you took the job, we decided, we thought going in was going to be career, life forever. You thought so? Yeah. I, I kind of did. I don't know. We didn't, yeah. and I will I say that, that we didn't really have any experience at all <clears throat> with the military. Right. Growing up in the Chicago suburbs, it's just not something you see or hear. <laughs> you go into the city sometimes and you see the guys, the I think there's basic trainees from the of Navy. factors going on. Uh, you know, we grew up in the 70s and 80s uh, in a point of relative peacetime. It was after yeah. Vietnam, mm -hmm. uh, a few years after Vietnam, Marty and I were born. And, you know, we just kind of, it was peacetime largely. There weren't any major conflicts that were in our lives growing up. And so there was no draft, certainly. And there wasn't right. a lot of I mean, right. people joining the military in droves. So we had no personal experience with it. So we really didn't have any expectations of what it would be like. Yeah, that's right. So I do remember Michael had accepted his commission. You were a right. first, first lieutenant, lieutenant in the United we States were, Air Force. And yeah. I had to go to officer training school just to kind of learn the protocol. You had to learn and, how to march. You know, as a former athlete, <laughs> I really enjoyed it probably more than most in some ways because there was a lot of physical training that was really a part of the culture. And I had always been, you know, not only competitive as an athlete in baseball and other sports, but I enjoyed working out. Especially yeah. when I was younger, in my twenties and teens, so it was really easy. I mean, I would have to say for you, you would probably say too, having been you know a fiance and then a wife, that culturally, you know, just in you terms of right lifestyle, in. I was that was easy. That was kind of the poster you boy. You're the I'm only guy that. that showed up that didn't have any problems getting up at five o'clock in the right? morning. I me. always had gotten up early, just as a matter of course, still in my does. civilian life, and still I still does. do mm -hmm. today. So, 
Yeah, we didn't experience, I mean, as point one, was there any major issues in terms of transitioning into the military, both no. me individually or us as a couple? I'd say the biggest culture shock for me was when I went to visit him before we got married in Alabama. Mm. Um, I had never been to the South before. Yeah, and so nothing to do with the military. No. Culture. This was just Marnie going south of the Mason-Dixon line. Way south. And trying to figure out life down there. Um, so I, I, it was... It was very different. Montgomery, Alabama is a very different place from the northern suburbs right. of Chicago. And yep. honestly, your whole experience has been Chicago. I couldn't Champaign. understand everything that came. So, my mm -hmm. first experience is he picked me up from the airport, we went out to lunch. Right. And the lady, the waitress, asked me, Well, this is what I heard. Y'all want some soy tea? And you didn't think you couldn't figure out what that I was. I looked at Michael and I said, She's speaking mm -hmm. English. And so, what she asked me was, Do you want some sweet tea? Yeah. But even you if she had been speaking was. in a clear accent, I wouldn't have understood. I'd never yeah. heard of sweet tea. I had about a month kind I've of been converted. I love it now. Down there, so I had a little <laughs> bit of time in the civilian economy, they would say. Yeah, but... The um, first time out to dinner or out to eat was, it was, it was kind different. of interesting. She didn't understand the language. Yeah. The dialect was totally different. Yeah. Now I love it, but, you know. Um, as far as... Yeah. For me, the highlight of that trip was, so when you're an officer in the Air Force, you get mm -hmm. a sticker. I don't think they still do, do they still do? I don't know, but at the they time, do, yeah. they had stickers on your car so you could get in and out of the base, yeah. and it was yep. color-coded yep. whether you were an officer, enlisted, non-commissioned officer, civilian, whatever. So Michael had the blue officer sticker, and when mm -hmm. you drive through the gate, they salute the car. Right. And exactly. so I had the car while he was in class or doing whatever, and so the other new fiancés and wives and girlfriends, we would just like drive in yeah. and out and in and out and in and out just so they could salute the huh? car. I thought that was the they coolest the thing. Yeah. Anyway, let's fast forward to we're married. Yes. We did not live on base. San Antonio is a very unique, it's a huge military city. Yeah, at the time, at the time there were five military installations kind of actively plus a uh, kind of an annex camp that was there as well called the ARSOC. But, yeah, and I mean, Camp Bullis. Kelly, Lackland, Brooks, Randolph, Fort Sam Houston on the Army side, Camp Bullis, Which and then the Medina, Medina ARSOC was affiliated But with most Lackland. people yeah. don't live on base here. They're, it's really more of like a right. commuter type base. Well, there's a lot of people that are on base um, at, at like Fort, Fort Sam, Sam and certain parts of Lackland. But we but, did it. You know, there certainly wasn't enough space on, on the base to accommodate all the active duty military members. So we didn't have a typical military experience that we did not live on base. We didn't get that mm -hmm. full experience. But True. I'm going to speak right. to my experience because obviously I was, um, for the first half of his career, I was, or for the first bit, I was a working wife. And then the rest of it, I was a stay-at-home mom. Mm -hmm. um, That's true. So, you know, moving to a new city, whether you're military or not, I knew nobody. True. Obviously, I made some friends through work, but the other way that I met a lot of people um, was joining all the different clubs that they had. So yeah, that's right. there was Michael was stationed at what is no longer here anymore, but it was no, at the it's time still, it's just affiliated. It's just a different base. smushed into another base. But the time yeah. was the Kelly Air Force Kelly Air Force Base, mm -hmm. and so which I now, joined, which is now Lackland Air Force Base. Yes, yeah. I joined the Kelly Air Force Base Officers Wives Club. Right. And Michael was uh -huh. attached to the Air Intelligence Agency. Yeah, a special division. Am I allowed to say that? Of Kelly, yeah. It's, okay. It's part of the. Uh, as part of the defense intelligence community. I didn't even know that existed, but they had their own officer's wives club within the intelligence agency. So right, right. those two things, those two groups, I met a lot of interesting women. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I'm a joiner. So I joined, I was on the board yeah. and I was the editor of the, the newsletter, newsletter for the main base, Kelly. Yeah. You went to lots of luncheons. When, well, this was after club. I stopped yeah. working. Um, there were a lot of lunches, but when we worked, mm -hmm. we did bunko. We did bunko. We did couples right? bunko, Absolutely. and yeah. we did supper club. Mm -hmm. That was That's really right. fun. And the neat thing so. about that is you are in there with people around your own age, you know, the younger officers, but mm -hmm. then the older officers, like colonels, yeah, that's would true. join too, and it's slightly intimidating, mm -hmm. but kind of neat to see people in the same career field a little bit ahead of you. They can right. give you advice. Like, it, it, was, it, it was was a really it neat. Was, it was very interesting. I I'll tell you, the one it. thing that was different for us is as Marty keeps referring to officers. So the officers and the officers' wives would certainly hang out together. But the military, at least you know, 20 years ago when I was in, there was very strict on kind of a no fraternization rule. So in America, the <laughs> military officers in America are not to really you know, socialize much at all with uh, people of enlisted ranks, including NCOs or non-commissioned officers. That was kind of off, um, coupled with the fact that I was in the JAG Corps and so, uh, <laughs> they as a consequence, to be friends with you. 
you know, the rules and regulations had to be enforced. So we, it, it was a different experience. We've never really had such an overtly class-based experience in that regard. Yeah. I think we were okay with it in the sense that we fit in okay, but it was different, I tell you. Um, to kind of look at people based on rank in that way was a Strange. completely foreign concept from you know anything you got in a little you got a little lecture do you remember i don't recall you used to love playing basketball yeah, working out with the guys the yeah in the lunchtime league that we play on base you know you kind of get a group of guys together just kind of a conglomerate of officers and ncos and enlisted folks but you um, uh you got a little talking to that that needed to stop yeah i can't remember I the specifics around that but again you know there especially as a prosecutor i was a military prosecutor it was it was it was an important role that you know not only you play you know technically the role of prosecutor but you know the military is big on any kind of an appearance of any impropriety yes. is is really taboo and so yeah my kind of profession in the military was such that i needed to really mind my p's and q's yeah, because i was enforcing the rules um, which got, is a little different i would you say you only got in trouble twice what was the second time? The second time was when you were speeding on base because I thought, well, I had gone into labor and he was going home. So oh, yeah, that's right. as far as the rest <laughs> of the wife experience stuff, and then I want you to talk a little bit trip, about your professional yeah. stuff, at least the stuff that security cleared. Um, I did, even though we did not live on base, we didn't live anywhere, well, about 20 minutes we about off 20 base. Minutes off, yeah. Now it's about an hour. Mm -hmm. Traffic has changed a bit since we yeah. first came to San Antonio. Well, the benefit for us is we got an opportunity to really see San Antonio, yes. which is a town that we had no prior affiliation with. Mm -hmm. But we, yeah. grew, we obviously grew into it through the military and um, came to love it. To so we did all our grocery on shopping on base. Um, mm -hmm. We lived closer to a different base called Randolph, Randolph Air Force Base, right. which is still here in San Antonio. Yeah, so we would right. do our week, well, I would do our weekly shopping. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd go together. Uh, we've always loved grocery shopping together. Mm -hmm. We grocery did our grocery shopping on Randolph, which is a grocery store on a base is called the commissary. So we do all our right. grocery shopping at the commissary. Yeah, we do that once sometimes, a week, huh? Sometimes we go to, Fort, you could go to any base. So Most sometimes we go to Fort Randolph. Sam. Fort Most Sam was a lot more regimented. They, I remember they had arrows pointing in the direction you could go down the aisles. <laughs> Um, that's army for you. And then yep. we did all of our department store kind of shopping at the B, the base exchange, the BX. I think mm -hmm. if you're army, it's, it's PX, post exchange. Post exchange. Yeah. Um, right. And it's sort of like a big department store. Like and a it, Walmart almost, it, huh? it, Yeah, a Walmart that also has like high-end cosmetics and handbags, mm -hmm. like Coach and Dooney and Bork. And Randolph like had a pretty big one, but I remember Lackland's had kind of yeah, a, a nice shopping one. mall, kind of a small little shopping mall. Yeah, and a food a big, court, big, remember? Yeah, a large exchange yeah, and a food court. That. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then yeah. my biggest experience as a wife on base had to have been Jake was born on base. At right. the, at, at the time, uh, Wilford Hall Wilford was kind Hall. of a thriving military hospital. Yeah. Like the Air Force Hospital. And yeah. Yeah. Um, I yeah. have to tell you, I've had one child in the military and mm -hmm. one child at a very expensive, exclusive hospital. Right. And my experience was probably better on I base. So. I mean, I had two wonderful it experiences. Markedly better in some ways in terms of just accommodations. Yeah. The room was amazing on the military house. We had champagne. They gave me champagne. Right. Then we I were kind of rushed or any sense of feeling like you needed to be discharged anytime quickly. No. I think you actually spent like an extra day and a half I did. or so. They were like, take your time. Yeah. Just to kind of be, it was, it was really more comfortable, I would say. Yeah. We didn't feel any sense of being pressured to kind of the insurance is a little different when you're in the military. I, and again, I'm sure yeah. things have changed and you all, there are many horror stories and I've heard them myself from I mean, other people, sure. Okay. But our experience was always wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. So all I can say from my experiences, we had, a, I had a great time. I loved, I loved visiting Michael at work. The people he worked with social. were there amazing. Were of, there was uh, so much camaraderie. And there were a lot of little award ceremonies. You know, the military is big on not only having your rank, but within the confines of your rank getting, you know, kind of within grade, kind of step increases um, and awards, you know, like mm -hmm. officer of the year, officer of the quarter, you got like various a thousand types of awards, of those. He's like uh, the attorney of the year, uh, awesome. outstanding government attorney in the Alamo City Award, I think I had gotten one year. You had a lot and of And this awards. was all within the span of a small confine of time of just three Two and years. a half of actual active duty work. Um, but as a, as a result oh, of that, we had lots of little ceremonies. I mean, the military was big on that. I, I picked up a lot on on that type of work. And, and you know, I think I became a good civilian manager when I got into my law firm and uh, corporate world jobs yeah. as well. But I, so kept the ceremonies I took going. a lot of it's very, those ceremonies are important. I mean, they really build esprit de corps amongst offices, amongst people on the team. My eyelashes are and, sticking. And uh, I think it also helps 
from a family perspective, Marty got to participate in these awards. Yeah. He used to come to the base quite frequently for mm -hmm. lunch outings where we used to It was nice. Do little I mean, awards. and the flip side is when he was in the corporate world and when he worked for one business mm -hmm. for 10 years, I right. was there once in 10 years. Yeah, it was not as accommodating to full no. families getting together, unfortunately, the way the military was. So I would say other so. than salary, um, there are some benefits to private practice. But other, but other than that, I would say from the spouse's side, your experience in the military was much more fulfilling. Oh, it was unbelievably fulfilling. It was probably the best professional experience I could have ever hoped for, for a couple of reasons. One, as the judge had kind of previewed with me when I was in my third year of law school, it gave me the opportunity to get huge volumes of trial advocacy experience uh, that was exponentially more than most people have in an entire career in a law firm or in a corporate law firm setting. You did like a hundred jury trials yeah, in It was a years. tremendous amount of work in the courtroom, trying cases, getting cases ready for trial, going through evidence, and you're the only lawyer. It's a situation where you know, you're leanly staffed in the government, most of the, at least law, law jobs in the government, and this one in particular, and uh, you're just thrown into a tremendous level of responsibility and decision making. So I don't want to bore people too much with that, but that was a tremendously professional experience. And then we also, a while while I was you know not really a line officer because my principal job was to work as a prosecutor in the military, I had a secondary okay. job, and I think it was based on a you know my athleticism and my interest in physical fitness. I immediately kind of attracted the attention of a couple of young officers who were not lawyers but were kind of line officers that worked for a particular intelligence division, and um, I actually met these guys kind of working out and just seeing them around the gym. And they knew that I was an attorney, and uh, there came a time when they needed to have a legal advisor assigned to their unit. This was a unit that was highly active. They went out in the field and got hmm. into very interesting and in some ways very dangerous situations. And so they required a legal advisor to help them kind of navigate through the laws of armed conflict. Yeah, can we blow this thing up or not? Ask uh, Michael. Other kinds of things. Really I know, you can detailed kind of things. And so I actually deployed with them and went overseas to locations very far away in the east and the far east and, and other locations and got my security clearances upgraded. And so in addition to being a trial lawyer, I had the very unique opportunity to be what was considered a combat JAG. They call them combat JAG. A combat JAG, which is a special distinction and designation in the Air Force. You know, very few JAGs, I would say, have an opportunity well, to be a combat do. JAG. But I had the opportunity to be a combat jack for this unit. And I'll tell you, that was so unique because obviously there's nothing that you can replicate that experience with on the civilian side. That is truly a unique experience that is, you know, unique to the military. And so I think Marnie liked it too. It added a real interesting set of intrigue and excitement to, you know, what would otherwise just be a relatively normal trial job. Like a desk job. Yeah. No, there yeah. were nights yeah. you slept on the hood of a Humvee or That's in a right. tree. Yeah. He loved it. He had, so, he had a blast. A or on a uh, POW camp. I mean, it was really interesting stuff. A fake POW camp. Yeah. That's let's, right. let's, it was a training exercise. Let's not, yeah. let's not make it scarier yeah. than it was. We were still in relative uh, it was, it was peace Bosnia, time. Stuff that was during Bosnia Herzegovina. Yeah. So, but, anyway, uh, beyond all that, <laughs> I guess uh, to kind of wrap that up. We loved it. Looking back on it, and I guess sometimes you have a tendency to sugarcoat it or you can look through rose-colored glasses when you're, you know, about 20 years removed from the experience, but I can't really think of anything negative. Well, we should I mean, probably after all discuss time, why we didn't stay, because obviously if it was that wonderful, you'd still be in the military. There were a couple things. One, Well, um, there was a requirement that we'd have to PCS or do a permanent change of station. Moving every three years, every we three decided it wasn't for tough. us. Yeah. We started having our kids, obviously, and wanted them to be in a relatively stable environment growing up where yeah. they can develop a peer group and have some continuity with schools. That was it's just not for us. For, for, obviously, for most military families, not an issue. So primarily for us, we just, after living it, realized that it, moving every three years or so was just not, we mm -hmm. thought when we started that we'd be fine, but we realized, nah, not so much. And um, we were easier. also getting a lot of pressure and guilt from two sets of grandparents who wanted us to move back to the Chicago area because by then we'd already had our first grandchild. Right. That's true. So um, just everything kind of aligned and Michael's dad was retiring and we had our That's first right. child and yep. so we wanted to go and raise our kids um, up well, north. Of course then we lived through too. winter and then realized that we were moving to Yeah, well again. there were other factors too <laughs> that ultimately we found our way back to San Antonio yeah. rather quickly which is kind of beside the point for what we're talking about right now. Right. But um, 
It was a great. The it reality was a great is, yeah, for for a lot of people, I think it would be a wonderful decision to mm-hmm. make it as a career. But if not, I also think having been removed from it for a long time now, the ability to serve my country and the importance, even if it's just as a civilian doing some type of government service, yeah. to me is really important. And it's important for me um, to have done that. And I guess I don't want to impart too much on my kids or on others. But, you know, it's something that in America, we don't have a mandatory service of any sort. And I think that's a real problem. I think that people should serve the government in whatever capacity that they can. There's some intrinsic value you get from that. You may not understand what that value is at the time you're doing it. And sometimes I'm sure we were frustrated uh, with the day-to-day involvement and being in the government service or in the military service. A little bureaucracy sometimes. But, you know, looking back on it, I would say... It was a really positive experience, yeah. and uh, I think it made us better patriots. I think you and I are a little more in tune with you know what being an American is all about and uh, the value of service. Well, I also say because it got us out of our little bubble of where right. we lived. And there were a lot of people and did not come from families that uh, served in the military, and maybe mm-hmm. if you grew up in a different community where that was more relevant or more prevalent, yeah. that we feel differently. And we differently, met people but for from us, all over. Cool. Absolutely, yeah. In a, in a way that took us out of our... Uh, comfort zone in some ways. Yeah, it took a second. we thrived on it. We lo- I mean, well, we, we loved it so much that we decided not to go back to our little bubble and we stayed yeah. here. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. So uh, that was it. I don't know if we've answered all of your yeah. questions, but I thought... We're probably you could, not specific enough, but I think we should answer could, questions you right could, off. Yeah, definitely. so if you have more specific questions, you know, again, remember, this was from 96 to 2000, so... Early 2000, that's right. You know, right. Not, things have changed, <laughs> so Michael can only, and I can only answer from what we personally experienced, yeah. but we would both highly recommend government service or military service in any way. Yeah, For I the really boys, would. I don't know what life, you know, I don't that's know, the world's a different good. place right now, you know... Um, the threat of war was not really something we were dealing with back then. Yeah, so everything is kind of, you got to take it within context. I mean, my service was in really relative peacetime. There Mm -hmm. wasn't anything significant. It was before uh, 9-11. Yeah, we, you were done. We got out August 2000, and you were permanently out October 2000. That's, that's our little experience in 25 minutes or less. It was a great time, and we look back both of it fondly. And um, again, if you have any questions that are specific, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. And I just personally want to end with um, thank you to those who continue to serve, both the active duty member and the many family members that support them in that endeavor. Yeah, I I definitely did what Marnie has said here. It's a real honor to have served, and I'm real fond and uh, respectful of the people who are serving too, so... Hoorah and all that. Thank you very much. (laughs) And we will see you in the next video. Alrighty. Bye. See you later. Okay, Michael's walked in and announced he wants to do an outfit of the day. No, I'm not going to call it. You're really proud of this outfit you put together. it's, It's the beginning kind of climate change.